Yes, people, what's happening? And welcome to the Frankie Allen podcast. You are here with your host, Will Cranny, alongside the UK's most feared comedian, Frankie Allen, who isn't feeling very good right now, are you? I'm not the UK's most feared comedian. I've got a lot of fear <laughs> because where we are, oh, we're on the 15th floor. I'm very scared. Thankfully, our guest in the building today is going to be able to help you out. I'll just fill you in on who he is first, a little bit about him. We have got Phil Steele, a.k.a. The Mind PT, with us today in our brand new studio setup, and that's why Frank's bottle is gone, but we'll yeah. be able to talk to you about that in a minute. Phil is a psychologist, mind coach, hypnotist, Reiki master, known for working with top Premier League footballers, MMA fighters, boxers, including Callum Smith and the Smith Brothers, David Price, Tasha Jonas, Jazza Dickinson, Marcel Braithwaite, to name a few. And uh, he's a good mate of ours. He's a great mate of Frank's. And uh, great to have you in today, Phil. How are you, mate? I'm happy to be here with the UK's most fearful comedian. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Uh, but listen, before we start then, why don't we do something quickly to get you feeling a bit calmer? If you can, if you don't mind, Phil. Yeah. Okay, and of course, anyone watching this at home, welcome to do this as well. So, yeah. just before uh, you kick off, there, on. Phil, I just want to get you know give people a bit of yeah. you know, background a, a bit of back, on background today. to this. So, me, Phil, Frank, we we've all known each other for a very long time for various reasons, and we'll talk about a little bit more about that in this podcast. However, I phoned Frank last week and said, "Look, we're gonna go into a new podcast studio, and the reason being is because we want to." elevate the production quality we want to bring in cool guests like phil like you know others that we've got lined up in future i said the only problem is it's 15 floors up and what was your reaction to that well i just freaked out i didn't want to go really i really didn't want to you know so fill me in today have you been uh, stressed about coming very down? stressed okay very stressed. couldn't sleep last night um just driving here was it's like as though i was driving towards my death just okay, driving yeah. towards highway to the danger zone that's it not yeah. taking the piss either so we get no, in the lift I felt as though I'm on Queen's Drive and I'm driving down Queen's Drive and I felt as though when I got to the end I was literally just going to fall off the edge of the world and that was just the end of me so just like a horrible black cloud hanging over me so we, because we, I knew I had to work on the 15th floor we got in the lift of a building he, you walked in pretty casual Ugh. got in the lift there's another lad in the lift yeah. Ninth floor, he pressed on the button. I pressed 15th floor. As we got up to the ninth floor, Frank goes, fucking hell, fucking hell, what floor are we on? What floor are we on? And then just bailed, got out the lift and said, I'm going to have my bottle's gone. I'm going to yeah. have to meet you Well, upstairs. I'll be honest with you, this was only an hour ago. It was a good job, it really was, that the lift stopped when it did on the ninth floor because I could really just feel myself going. Like, as though, I felt as though, the fear was, I felt as though I'd been buried alive. Okay, now, Phil, fill us in a little bit about that. Is that, like, kind of rational or...? Yeah, I mean, what I'd be interested to know is from from what age can you remember having feelings like this in an enclosed space? From a very kind of early age, although... I've not been able to fly, have I, for, for 20 years, and uh, I did fly, went to Tenerife, as you know, to work about two years ago, 18 months ago, whatever it was, and because I came to see you, I got, I got rid of me fear of flying, at least to get me there for four hours and four and a half hours back, whatever it was. But I had a horrendous fear of flying. I've actually been in, in a life-threatening situation in hospital where they were taking me down for an emergency operation and I just stopped them and mm. just said, fuck off. I'm just not having it. What a, what a because I, is it, maybe it's the lack of control, loss of control. I think if I'm leaving my fate, my destiny in someone else's hands, maybe. Mm. I just I didn't have the operation. I've been in a situation when I've been in a sunbed and um, didn't know how to get out of the bed. One of these stand-up ones, couldn't find the door. Were you bollocko as well? Nothing on, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the sun bed was going. I didn't know. I did. I, did, I, I, I freaked out. Felt again as though I was buried alive. All I could see was these lights around me, and I couldn't find a door to get out. And I just screamed and started shaking mm. from head to foot. And thank God, 
you know, in the end it went off and I found a door. Yeah. But even now I don't feel very comfortable here at all. Well, like what the question that's that's sticking out to me, and you don't have to answer this on mm -hmm. here, you can tell me later if you want, is generally when when people have phobias like this, uh, it's often down to lack of control. Yeah. So you're in that lift, you know you cannot control the lift. Yeah. You can press buttons, but you cannot control it. Likewise with a plane, likewise with that sun shower you went on. So that would lead me to the question, which you don't have to answer now. Go away and think about it, and we can do stuff around it. Uh, Maybe you had, like, a parent when you were younger or an important person in your life when you were younger whose behaviour was a bit irrational and you never knew how they were going to be. Maybe mm. they were angry one day and the next minute you didn't, you were in trouble and, and you do the same thing and it can with you because that leads to us having a lack of control as we're younger. And when we can't control things, we don't know what's going to happen. When we don't know what's going to happen, it leads to uncertainty, which leads to fear, which can be magnified in an aeroplane, can be magnified in a lift where you're not in control. Space, yeah. yeah. I mean, do you feel, just out of curiosity, yeah. so right now you've gone up in the lift. I mean, for me, no problem whatsoever, probably for Phil or whoever. Yeah. Most people, the majority of people, no problem whatsoever. How genuinely do you feel when you step in the lift and you think, fucking hell, I've got to go up 15 floors? Horrible, horrible, sickly feeling in my stomach and... Uh... I mean, this lift wasn't too bad, really, because it's a modern... You couldn't really hear yourself moving in it. Yeah. So I really didn't know where we were. And for some reason, I thought we were on the third floor. <laughs> and when, we, when we were on the ninth, it came up very quickly. But just as we were coming towards... The, the doors couldn't have opened at a better time. I was ready to freak out and start screaming. Mm. And and I just felt as though I wanted to fall on the floor and cover myself up. Yeah. You know, and scream. Mm. And I just... So when it, when we got to the ninth floor, I got out and obviously walked up the rest of like the, the, the next six floors. Is this a common thing, Phil? It's one of the most common phobias yeah. people have, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, what, one of the biggest phobias that people are coming to me with, which I'd never heard of till I got into this life, is being in a car on the motorway and this anxiety comes over them because if you think about it metaphorically yeah. when you're on the motorway you're in a fast place fast paced environment mm -hmm. and your safety is not only in your hands but it's in the hands of the people around you and most of the time when we're on the motorway we're far away from home so psychologically we're away from our comfort zone yeah so i would link that fear of flying confined spaces as one sort of form of anxiety yeah can be can be beaten. Can yeah, be I've, I've been fine on the motorway, but I do know a friend of mine, John. Yeah. I won't tell you the second name. He's had a terrible time on the motorways. He's mm. had to stop and he lost it completely and ran down the motorway. He feels threatened when he's driving somehow on the motorway. Why is that? Yeah, like I say, yeah. it's it's the environment, it's the pressure, yeah. everything that everything that makes us feel scared. It's the pressure we create in our minds. So let's say like that operation that you, you couldn't go for. Yeah. You're building it up in your head, this pressure in your head, and then suddenly it's time to go, oh, no, I can't go. But it, it can be managed. It can be taken away or yeah. it can be managed. Like the, with the flying, when we did your session with the flying, it yeah. gave you that little quick boost for you to get to Tenerife. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, you know, I'll leave that question with you. Think back mm. to when you... Because the thing is with the human brain, once you can put a label on something, once you can understand something, often it takes away a bit of the fear around it. Okay. That's why, like, you know, in in situations when relationships end and that, people need closure. Why why did it happen? Why did that happen? Once they get that label, that closure, oh, okay, that makes sense now. Okay. Yeah. Then everything's so, put into a box, yeah. basically. So if you can understand why this phobia developed, that'll go a long way for helping you to okay. manage it. So, Frank, fill us in. You've, how are you feeling right still, now? Still very nervous. Okay. But Is not as bad as it was in the lift. Is there anything you can do now? Do you yeah, do a little quick relaxation thing. Yeah. So okay. uh, again, this is if anyone here wants to do this at home, you know what I'd say is just get yourself comfy. Don't do this if you've got epilepsy or diabetes. I know that you haven't got either of them, have you? No. Stades. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, joking, by the way. Wasn't I supposed to tell anyone. No, I'll leave, the jokes. <laughs> I'll leave the jokes to you. So put your feet flat for us. Okay. Close your eyes. Do you want me to do this as well, Phil? If you want, will you? Yeah. I'll get involved, yeah, okay, of course. close your eyes. Okay. With your eyes closed now, I want you to imagine that you're breathing all the way from your feet up to the top of your head. Breathe. 
breathing from your feet up to the top of your head. Breathing now from your knees all the way to the top of your head. Breathing from your knees all the way to the top of your head. And from your waist, from your waist to the top of your head. And from your chest, from your chest to the top of your head. Very good, keep going. And now it's as though you're standing in front of a lake or a pool or a sea of water. And as your breathing becomes calmer now, the waves and the ripples in the water become calmer too. And when you're ready, just in your head, very slowly when you're ready in your head, count to three in your head, then open your eyes, feeling calmer. Okay, mate. How do you feel? A lot better. Yeah. Little tons better, really. Yeah. Yeah, feel a lot better. So you got oxygen to you? Feel as though, yeah, I feel like I've been on, on oxygen mask. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Yeah. You're, you're What's a, going you're on a, there with the oxygen? You are a very uh, hypnotisable subject. Of, yeah. or I've must have hypnotised well over maybe yeah. 2,000 people. You're definitely one of the most hypnotisable. But funny enough, I've always been very sceptical, really, about being hypnotised. I thought I was too strong until I went to see you. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, talking to you first couple of minutes and you went, ah, oh, that's it. Like, bloody hell, this is short, you know. We had like an hour and 10 minutes or something. we have gone by. Yeah. When I didn't, you know, just gone. So you're feeling a lot better now? Feel a lot better, yeah. So to anyone who doesn't know uh, Phil or doesn't know the relationship yeah. that we've all got and, and you yeah. know, the backstory to all of this, yeah. I, I just want to give people a bit of an idea of, you know, when we keep referencing the flying situation and all the rest of it. So, Frank, where did you meet Phil? Well, I met Phil, basically, uh, met Phil, met Phil basically through you, didn't I? You recommended him for the... For the um, was it the it wasn't at a show, the show, it was a performance, wasn't it? Oh, sorry, yeah, I'm talking, I'm talking about the hypnotism now. Yeah. Forgive me, it's just my head's all over the place with this. <laughs> um, yeah, I worked with Phil. He, he, he's got his own office, you know, the Port of Liverpool building, and he hypnotised people, but he's also he, a comedy hypnotist. Yeah, I think Frank's a little bit out of it, so I'll I'm take just, over for yeah, a little minute. In a minute, 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 you'll be amazing. I'm gone, mate. He's, he's gone, chilling man. out. So basically, Frank's got a lot of fears, um, fears of lifts, fears of escalators, fears of uh, flying which is which is actually quite you know it, it's quite funny considering yeah. he's known as the uk's most feared comedian but you don't mind talking about this because no. you know there's a lot of lads who'll be listening to this who you know who are just the same as us who have got similar fears and who might might have struggled with them for a very very long time and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to bring phil on today not only is you know top of his game with you know being a psychologist a mind coach being able to help people working with some top athletes he's also just just like us. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I think people would resonate with him. Um, you know, and he might be able to bring you some nuggets of information where you think, fucking hell, you know, it, that's massively helped me, much like you've just seen. You know, this isn't staged, is it, Frank? No, I mean, being honest with you, before Phil came, I'll be honest, I nearly ran out of here. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. Yeah. Well, I wasn't going to tell you, I was trying my very best to, keep to stay here. And it must be association, you know, because when Phil came in, I felt a, a lot better. Because you knew you were going to be cool. So, basically, a long, long time ago, me and Frank were due to fly to Tenerife. And mm. Frankie, how, how long hadn't you flown for? 20 years. In fact, it, I was that bad. An agent gave me a job in the Island Man, flying from Speak Airport in Liverpool. And the flight is only an hour, or 45 minutes or something like that. Very short. I was with another comic, a fellow called Tony Roscoe, another comedian at Servers, going over there. It's about five years ago. And uh, 
woke up on the morning of the flight at six o'clock and just destroyed, very nervous, shaking. I started drinking. The only thing that's ever got me to fly, when I used to fly to Germany and come back, even when I could fly over 20 years ago, I used to take a bottle of brandy with me on the plane and just keep drinking and drinking it till I was in an absolute, you know, stupor. I couldn't even move, you know. I was just blind, drunk. That was the only way I could. So when I got on the plane at Speak Airport, um, I'd already drinking like nearly three quarters of a bottle of brandy. Got on the plane, I was terribly nervous. I thought I was going to be okay. And as they were taxiing, the plane down the runway just jumped up and went, no, 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 no. And they let you off? They had to stop the plane. You were just that nervous? Couldn't do it. What year was that then? It's got to be, you know, 90s. 2010, something like that. 2012, something like that. Sort of. Anyway, got off the plane and uh, just couldn't do it. Caused a lot of trouble. People in the hotel in the Isle of Man, I had to pay them for the flight they paid. Obviously, didn't get paid because it didn't go. But that's when I decided don't experiment anymore, trying to do different things to get myself to fly. I just can't fly, and that was the end of it then for years. So, 2018, um, Frankie's initial video goes viral. You know, he was he was hot property at that time, and yeah. uh, everyone was trying to get a booking. And somebody in Tenerife contacted me and said, look, you know, do you fancy doing a show out here? Yeah. And I thought, wouldn't that be unbelievable? One, because, you know, it would be an interesting story to be able to tell. And two, because the, the venue looked amazing. So he offered to do a Tuesday night and a Wednesday night. And I just said, right, book it and we'll deal with we'll deal with what happens next. So I said, look, Frank, go and see Phil. Phil will be able to help you out with this situation. And were you sceptical at the time? It wasn't that I didn't believe that hypnotism worked. I, I did know and I've seen, obviously, Phil's act when he got people up to comedy hypnotism when people were under and they were doing silly things. Under, and I knew they were hypnotised. Yeah. You know, I knew that they weren't. It, it wasn't staged. That was the fi- Sorry, that was the first time you'd seen Phil. Yeah, was that, so I knew that it worked. Show. But I thought myself personally, I, well, I was too far gone. I was too stubborn. A client had had it for too long. I didn't believe that it could be the fear of flying could be taken away I just thought that I've got it for life you know because yeah that's how we met so like in in the world of so I'm trained in clinical hypnotherapy and in the world of hypnosis there's two two branches really there's the clinical hypnotherapist who help people with anxiety and confidence and motivation and then there's the stage hypnotist the comedy hypnotist okay. now there's a bit of beef between the two sectors because the therapist ones a lot of them a lot older than me and a very, oh yeah, you know, you shouldn't hypnotise people for jokes. Yeah. Because they're not that good at hypnosis. Whereas the stage ones, the street ones, they don't really know the therapy elements. So they potentially could do dangerous things. One could get you up on stage, yeah. not know about your phobias and say, right, you're in the lift now and when I click my fingers, so you'd have an abiatch. Dangerous, abiatic, yeah. It could be dangerous. But one thing that inspired me was, my, my whole thing that drives me in life is... If I'm going to do something, I want to try my hardest at it. I want to try and be the best. So l- let me ask you this then yeah. first. How the fucking hell do you end up, you know, you're just one of the lads like us. How yeah. do you end up in the position that you're in in the first place? Well, um, so I'm 36 now. From, I used to be very outgoing, very um, an extrovert, yeah. you know, the joke with the clown. And then when I got to like, when I was 18, um, my parents had split up when I was when I was a teenager, and I never really recovered from that. I went to live with my nan and my granddad and my mum. My nan had Alzheimer's. It was it was a difficult time, and I sort of I went into depression. So when I was 18, 19, I was drinking loads. I was going out fighting, trying to prove myself like a knobhead, to be honest. Okay. Then as I got into my twenties, I had a really strong work ethic because my granddad brought me up. He was a really you know old school, hard working guy. But I had this broken part of me, this trauma. So I'd work hard Monday to Friday. Weekends, I'd go out and just party. Yeah. And then I'd be mm. guilty all weekend. It was a cycle. So I got to get to me end of my 20s. And by that point, I just knew no one's going to come and change me. No one's going to come and help me. And I went on this path of self-discovery. I read a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl about a, a psychologist who survived Auschwitz. Okay. And it talks about, you know, his whole thing was... 
um, if you can't change a situation, change yourself. Went on this voyage of self-discovery and, and I sort of thought, you know what? I'd lo- I felt inspired by people like Tony Robbins. Yep. You've probably heard of and I thought I'd love to be able to inspire people. So I was like, okay, well, what could I learn? I'm a big believer in education. So I went and did a diploma in hypnotherapy and then it just went from there. My so whole what life are you changed. doing at that point in your life? So how old are you? So that, I was 29 and I was a senior manager in Shop Direct, not Sports Direct as people always imagine and ask me for f- discounts on flip-flops and that. No. <laughs> Shop Direct who own very in Little Woods. Frank would have been after the track yeah. after you there. Or one of them big cups, <laughs> them massive mugs, yeah. Um, so I was a, at that point I'd worked my way up. As I said, I had a great work ethic. I never used to, I'd never drink the night before work and stuff like that. Work my way up. And I was like, um, I was working, I think, called customer management, which is more about, we'd work with the marketing team and we'd say, right, you did these marketing campaigns and this is how successful you were or weren't. Now, the actual, uh, the big catalyst was, so towards the end of my 20s, I'd, I'd, I'd like, uh, I got about to get married, I'd just got married, had my first child. Um, the way Christmas fell, it was a night out okay. and I asked for a holiday for the next day so I could go on a night out didn't get the holiday so I was like well oh. fucking hell went out on the night anyway woke up in the morning still pissed and I thought I can't go to work like this so I rang in sick and um, little tip for you I've shared this with other people if you anyone watching at home if you want to phone in sick when you ring work lie upside down like that you, you sound a bit sicker in your voice so okay. I've done that right yeah. rang in sick and I thought I can't just take one day off it looks dead dodgy so I've stayed off for this week and during that week I felt so guilty with anxiety due yeah. to the fact that you'd been drinking that, or no what? because I'm pretending to be sick okay. yeah I get it Fucking, like shit myself but is that just out of curiosity yeah. because you know much like yourself I, I like having a little drink and I go out and party and stuff but I always feel flat Yeah, you know in the days afterwards is that the, just you know well, alcohol induced or that probably played into it but it was more a case that, listen my my work ethic was so strong is so strong you didn't sorry. want to let anyone down yeah like okay. even when I when I was genuinely sick say I had to go to the doctor or the chemist I'd be worried someone from work could see me and think I was faking it okay. so that week anyway I thought I can't take one day off looks that dodgy because I've asked for a holiday didn't get it stayed yeah. off for the week hated myself went back to work as luck would have it I got sick I genuinely got sick so I was off again for a week. Okay. And I was like, right, this is the week. I've got to do something with my life. I can't keep going like this. So I read Tony Robbins. I watched the documentary on YouTube about, you know, James Gandolfini, who was in The Sopranos. Yeah, yeah. It's a great documentary. He goes over to Afghan, I think, and he's with American servicemen who've lost limbs and are dead depressed. And he's like, you know, cheering them up and that. And it was like, Wow. Read that book, Man Search for Meaning, and then I was like, you know what, this is not. I've got to, I've got to do something with my life now. Then I went and learned the hypnosis diploma, and then everything spiraled from there. It's like the momentum grew and grew and grew, to the point where so there's a beef between therapist and stage <laughs> hypnotist, right? Now I, I was like, I want to try stage hypnosis because it, it takes skill, as you know, getting up on a stage. Yeah. So I thought, I wonder if I could do that. So. I did like a little show in this pub in Anfield. Uh, was it the Sandown? Sandown. Sandown, yeah. You know, I, I thought I was dying on stage, and then I got this lad up. Wow! Bam! Went under like a stone in water, mm. like a pebble, so deep. So that gave me a bit of confidence. Did a show in Crosby Comrades Club, and then I got booked to appear, and that's where we first met at the Epstein Theatre. So that was my third yeah. show. Yeah. What two hundred people, three hundred people? You went down great, though, Phil. You, you know fantastic. what? I hadn't drank for a year, and. Just did decide to stop drinking to grow my business. And I got there, and I was like, I'm gonna have to have a bevy. I had two bevies, and I'm sitting on the stage, the curtains are up, and I'm feeling a bit pissed. And before I can hear myself getting introduced, and I just see you before the curtains go up going. And I was like, fuck, I'm gonna be all right here. And then they yeah. come up and loved it. And I haven't, I haven't done any shows that after that. Performance that's the last show you've done? Yeah, I don't know if I'd if I do anymore. If I did, it'd have to be big, bigger, bigger, bigger. Yeah, not yeah, not yeah. for like an ego thing, but with stage hypnosis, the more people, the better. Well, funny you should say that because. Years ago, my mum buys me some tickets for my birthday to go and see Darren Brown. The re- main reason why I'm fascinated by Darren Brown, I mean, I've read his books, Happy and stuff, I think is fantastic. But I'm interested in, surely that's not legit. Yeah, that's what I, you know, I'm fascinated by how the fucking hell is he doing what he's doing? And are they plants in the audience? So me and my friend go to see Darren Brown, Liverpool Empire. The show is going on and on. and He's getting people out of the crowd throughout the whole show. It comes to the end of the show. 
and he says, right, this is my final act, right? And I'm thinking, I'm a bit gutted because I thought, yeah, it wasn't real because, you know, me or my friend or anyone yeah. by chance hasn't been called up on stage and surely these are all plants, blah, blah, blah. So comes to the end of the show and he says, has anyone got a birthday in the room? Some girl puts her hand up. She gets up on stage and he makes the whole room sing happy birthday to her. While he's doing it, he releases all these balloons into the crowd, right? So balloons are coming everywhere. Grab a balloon, grab a balloon. So this balloon starts floating over and I've just sat there very quietly and I'm thinking, this balloon's going to come to me. So it goes boom, boom through the air. It goes to the person who could easily have caught it and they just go, knock it on one. It falls straight into my lap, yeah. right? So anyone who's got a balloon, stand up. So we all stand up, anyone who's got a balloon. I want you to, three people out of the under balloons or whatever have gone out to join you for your birthday party to the girl on stage. So she picks the first person and then she goes, the lad in the striped shirt. And I go, it's me, right, okay. So it gets up on stage with Darren Brown. Darren Brown has, has a balloon that he's, he's given me, so I put it on the back of the chair. And basically what he, what he got me to do was he had building blocks all over the table and a, a black kind of cylinder. And he basically said, this girl is going to shout out four numbers to you. You've got to pick the building blocks up while you're blindfolded and you've got to place them into the, into the tunnel or the cylinder, whatever it is. So I'm standing on stage in front of thousands of people here at the Empire with a blindfold on. I'm thinking, fucking hell, I'm going to fuck up his main <laughs> events, his main act, because I'm not listening to a word he's saying. This mm -hmm. is going right over my head. And I'm not a plant. I'm not part of the show. That's all I could think, right? So this girl shouts out these four numbers to me. So I try and pick the right building blocks, stack them on top of each other. But I'm still thinking, fucking hell, this is guesswork. I'm fucking this up. He then asks the person who's next in line and then the girl on the end. He makes us all sit down and one by one, he uh, he says, right, I'm going to lift up the cylinder and see if you got the numbers right that I've called out. So the numbers were 5886 and it said 2102. That's what I'd built. And he said, you know what? You're the worst contestant I've ever had on here. You, you know, you've seriously messed this up. And I, my, my head was gone. I thought, oh my God, what's happening here? Then the next person, he said, oh, you got that half right. The third person, he says to, um, you've got that spot on. So the other two people who've messed up, where have you got those numbers from? They give me a pin. He said, put a hole in your balloon. I put a hole in the balloon. It just said 2102 on a piece of paper in the balloon. At the start of the show, he said, have a look at the date that is above the stage, 21st of February. It had the, the year was the next person along. And then some other thing with the last girl, I couldn't believe it, Phil. At the end of it, he said, I've just uh, hypnotized the four most easyable hypnotist, you know, most hypnotizable yeah. people in the room. Why is that? Because that baffled, that bit uh, blow, blew my head off. Yeah, I mean, how can we dissect that? I, I, I definitely think there's some trickery involved there in terms of the props he used. I definitely believe there's massive elements of suggestibility he's used on you. Okay. The thing with Darren Brown is he, he, he is such an enigma. Like, he, he, you could go on forums, countless forums, trying to understand how he does certain things. Okay. Um, it is, his branch of magic and hypnosis is called mentalism, and he's probably the foremost at that. Yeah. <laughs> but, mate... I'm lost how to explain that one. No, it's, it, you know, it's a mad one, but it comes back around to, you know, as we're talking about, some people are, are quite sceptical with it. I was yeah. quite sceptical with it. Frank, when you initially went to see Phil, you were sceptical about hypnosis in the first place, weren't you? Yeah, but I mean, you could, you've got to believe your eyes if things are happening. And, you know, I'm, I like to think I'm very kind of uh, discerning. And I can see if something's staged and it's not staged. And I could see it was really working. So yeah, yeah. There's a there's a new uh, field in psychology called animalistic psychology, which is the study of like ghosts and mm. phenomena of of that type. And and one of the things they found is, if they take say a group of twenty people, mm. and ten of them are self -conce self confessed skeptics and ten are believers, and they say, listen, we're going to play you a recording in a minute that's got ghostly voices on. 
just because they've made that suggestion, half the skeptics then become believers because they, they think they can hear something. Right. Okay. Everything in life is influence and suggestion. You know yourself, Frankie, when you when you're doing a, a gig, you know there's certain people by their body language, by the way they look, prime target him. I'll fucking rip him. That's right. And you probably know there's a few where you think, I can tell by his body language, there's no point trying to engage with him. Yeah. Mm. What's he even here for? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And and it's like you said when I came in, you felt a bit calmer because of the influence I've already got on you, because you know what I can do in terms yeah. of the mind and that. But that sounds fascinating, mate. Down around. I've never actually seen one of his shows, you know. Mate, since I'm, I'm a big shows. believer. I couldn't believe it. Um, but you know, obviously proofs in the pudding. But rolling back to the show. So we get this these two shows booked in, in Tenerife. Yep. And Frank hadn't flown for a very, very long time. As he said, he jumped off a plane on the way to the fucking island, man. I said, look, Phil's your man. Let's get this sorted. I actually called Phil and said, do you think you can sort this out? He was like, mate, 100%, okay? Frank goes in to see Phil for the very first time, uh, you know, to eventually get himself to go to Tenerife. At the point where you're going to go and see Phil, are you thinking there's any chance of you getting on a plane or any chance of... I mean, I was open to it. I knew the hypnotism could work. I just didn't think it could work on me because I thought I was far too stubborn. I thought this fear is so intense. Nothing will alleviate it. There's no way. I think it was kind of like a month away or something, wasn't it, before we went? Yeah. I thought, we're not going to do this in a month, you know, five weeks, whatever it was, six weeks. So, you know, obviously, and I mean, I did it. It was just incredible, unbelievable how I did it. Obviously, there's a sting in a tail with a story about how I got on the plane as though I was just walking into my living room, no fear Wait there, at wait all. there. Don't spoil the end of the story. Let's talk first about how Phil actually got you onto the plane yeah. in the first place. Okay. So, Phil, Frank comes into your office. What, you know, can you can you judge kind of how fearful someone is based on, on you know, the way they react to a certain topic or...? For, for me, I've got so much self-belief in the techniques that I'm going to use because yep. I tried and tested that. Yep. It doesn't um, it doesn't influence me how fearful someone is or how emotional Okay. because I know it's it's a process and it's going to work. I think that the thing that was apparent with, with yourself, Frankie, was we were, we were targeting, which was great, a specific event. We knew, right, you've got this flight coming up. Bam, we need to focus on that. It's a little bit different than say you'd come and said, look, I, I can't fly. I'd love to be able to fly one day. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, it was good because we had that element, we had that pressure on us. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's no different to, to when like, so Callum Smith, the boxer, he came to me and I can mention him because he's given me a testimonial, I'm not bringing confidentiality. He came before his world title fight with uh, George Groves. Okay. It wasn't like he was just rocking up. Oh, can you help me mind a bit? It was like, right. I want to see if we can get that extra 10% in my mind, which we got, and he won, obviously. And out of curiosity, is that extra 10%, is that extra 10% to have a little bit more belief? Is that extra 10%, you know, to, to feel like, you know, there's no, in no uncertain terms that he's going to win? What kind of, like, what's the mm. belief systems that you work on on that? Well, is, is Good that question. It's specific to each fighter and each footballer. With Callum, he was more, he, he wasn't going to let any... Uh, rock go unturned. He wants to make sure he was doing. He was seeing the best mind BT. He had yep. the best coach in George in him, um, Joe Gallagher. The best nutrition. So yep. for him, it, it, he was great. He was like, "Look, what can you do for me? How can you help me?" So uh, we just sort of honed his mindset skills. And and to be honest, he is the greatest visualizer I have ever met. In terms of when I ask someone to visualize something, I can. I actually think his brain's on a different level. A lot of top athletes, their brains are on a different level than us guys. Sorry, what do you mean by that? Like, sitting in his company, his brain's working faster than ours. It's like, they're like superhuman. Think of the abilities, think the things top athletes do. So when I'm talking to him about visualisation, the, the science he's giving me and the things he's saying, he's got an innate ability to visualise really powerful. Okay. So we, we really honed in and tapped in on that because there's a good thing. Some of your, your viewers may be familiar with the importance of visualisation. So, for example, with flying, people might, you might go to a, a lesser hypnotherapist and he might get you to visualise, oh, and now you're fine. And imagine now you're landing safely and the sun's shining and you're dead happy and you've got your giant Toblerone, et cetera, et cetera, which is important. But you've also got to, okay, now visualise now. You're on the plane and there's a little bit of turbulence. And there you are using that technique that I've taught you. So with him, it was a case of, it's great to visualise knocking Groves out. 
visualize yourself on the ropes with your back against the wall and stuff like that. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think in like, you might have people who like law of attraction and stuff like that. It's a bit easy to just focus on the positives. You've also got to prepare your mind for the negatives and how you get through them. So that you've already got in your mind how to deal with yeah, that situation so ahead of time. Go into autopilot. So when Frankie was walking onto the plane, it was like he was walking into his living room. Mm. Yeah, that's weird. So it took you about what six weeks or something to well, get ready. I think to be pretty, we had it cracked in like the first first one or two sessions, and we mm. we did the rest of the sessions and did a few other little things because you enjoy going into hypnosis mm. and you went so deep that we did a few a, few, a couple of other little things. Um, but like I always say about you guys, credit to you because obviously, Will, you and I have known each other since we were kids. Mm -hmm. And when you rang me, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, help, I'll help your dad, no worries at all. Yeah. And, and you're like, how much? I was like, no, I'll do it as a favor. And you're like, no, charge is the full price. Always charge your worth. Can't and I've just so, like, you know, salt of the earth guys. I don't do anyone any favors, you yeah. can't. It's your living, yeah. Isn't it? So I always appreciate that from you guys. Yeah, so we did them sessions. It went really positive. I was in conversations with both of us and knew the flight would go well. The only thing that I can't do as a mind PT is control weather, which mm. was the sting in the tail, wasn't well, it? Well, no, it wasn't weather. It wasn't bad weather. Wasn't well, it? Fill us in on, on, on the flight out there. So we well, went look, to Tenerife. We went to Tenerife. You went with Daisy, you know, Will's girlfriend. There was three of us going. We're in Manchester Airport. Everything was chilled. Everything was working, going to schedule, like clockwork. We were having a drink. It was great. Just went with the flow got in the queue, walking down the ramp onto the plane, felt okay, got on the plane, very smooth takeoff. Um, tiny little bit nervous when I looked down and I saw the ground. And uh, I said to Will, you know, isn't it strange? Look at, you know, people look like ants. And he said, uh, they are ants, we haven't took off yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so... Uh, Anyway, what a, an old gag, that one. Anyway, so we're flying, everything's great, the weather's okay. And it was just one of those, didn't seem, you know, four and a half hour flight. I wasn't saying, what time is it? You know, we were just talking and all of a sudden, two hours had gone by, two and a half hours, three hours. Then we're only like 20 minutes away from landing. And I thought, I can't believe I haven't flown for 20 years over in the rational fear, something was just absolutely ridiculous. You know, it really is so easy to fly and there's no danger. So coming into land, as we're coming into land, I could see the tops of the houses, pilots on, ladies and gentlemen, you know, landing shortly. I thought, oh, this is just fantastic. So as we're coming into land, suddenly the plane just, the nose went right up in the air and just flew. You could hear the engines roaring. Went right back up to like 30,000 feet and people just gasped. And then the f plane's just flying. No one's speaking. Doing loops. Just going round and round, yeah. And I thought, what the fuck is this? Mm. Look back down, you could see the beach and the hotel and everything again. Have we been hijacked? What the fuck? And I was going, we were landing. How come we're back up 30,000 feet? Then, not the pilot, it was one of the air hostesses, stewardess, whatever you call them. And it was a Spanish girl, because never, I remember a voice, very Spanish accent. And she said, we will not be landing at this time. That's all she said. Mm. I was, oh my God. Oh my God. So then the fear started coming back. Then we kind of found ourselves out at sea and we were flying, I could see, you know, and I told us, is this fella dumping fuel here? Mm. Oh, what the fuck is going on? So he'd done the kind of loop and he came back and then I realized what had happened. I remember from when I used to fly, when you're coming into land, obviously he presses a button to release the landing gear and you normally hear this electrical sound. Then you hear a big thud when the landing gear comes down. Now, I remember hearing on the first approach, hearing the electric wearing sound, but didn't hear the thud 
But I thought, well, it's that long since I've flown. Yeah. Maybe you don't hear it anymore. And when we came in the second time, no, so again, obviously the landing gear hadn't come down. So then he went round again. And then when I realised, you know, this is the fucking landing gear not coming down, I just went into total panic and was shaking. And yeah. um, the third time, lucky, we came in and he couldn't half hear it, you know. Uh, bang, the landing gear came down and we landed. No one explained to us. None of the air stewardesses said, you know, sorry about that, there was no apology. But um, it just obviously put me off flying for life yeah. again. And what are the chances of that happening? But the great victory of that is, the old you would never have even got on the plane. And oh, we could God. do more work now <laughs> so that you, you could fly. And it feeds back to what I was saying about this control because, right, great flight, it's landing, hang on, Wait, what, why are we doing this? Why are we going around? What, I've lost control, I don't know what's happening kicks into what I was saying at the start, where a lot of phobias come from, is lack of control, the unknown, the fear of the unknown. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, mean, I, I was in the airport with you, yeah. and I was expecting your bottle to be gone, to be hard work, and I had Phil's number, I was thinking, fucking hell, f uh, let's prepare Phil for fucking, he's going to have to be on the phone all day. That's a fly I just out. kept saying, are you, are you okay? And you were going, feel chilled, feel chilled. But at the same time, I know it was a struggle for you after that situation, which, as you said, is one in a fucking million. But again, if you were working with Phil again, you'd be able to get on the plane, wouldn't you feel comfortable? If we got another chance to go, I'd like to go. You know, if the lockdown's lifted, things get back to normal this year, we get a chance to go abroad again. I'd like to go, but I would have to go for more sessions. Yeah. yeah. So. For anyone who's, who's watching or listening, Phil, and, that you know, Dave got, you know, maybe a, an irrational fear or something, that, as you say, flying or driving on a motorway, as we spoke about earlier, lifts, escalators, whatever. Is that something that has to be worked on over a period of, you know, a certain amount of weeks or months? Or, or how, how do you usually go about the process with a certain person? So generally, what the service I offer now, because of the things I know about the mind and the brain, and I've got a, a master's in psychology from Edge Hill University, and I, I've got this toolkit now I can, I can use with people. We only need like three or four sessions. Okay. Because I'm a big believer in that old saying, uh, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man a fish, teach a man to fish, feed him for life. So I like to empower people with techniques. Phil, where are you getting all these sayings from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to remember the one the about, one. Where, you know, a, 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 when the tide comes in, it lifts all the ships. A rising tide floats all ships. A rising tide, yeah, fantastic, yeah. yeah. Oh, Christmas crackers, mate, you know what I mean? You like that one, don't you? Yeah. Uh, one in the bush is worth two in the hand. Never really got that one, though. No, a bit of bird. I know that one. It's a is bird it? in the hand is worth two oh, in the okay, bush. there you yeah. go, yeah. So if you've got something, it's more precious than the promise of something that you may not get, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Frank's bang into his quotes. There's actually a lad who used to work security for us and he used to come round on a Friday and Saturday, Will from Nottingham. He's actually from Nottingham, isn't he? Yeah. And I think your mate is his coach, but he used to come out with belters all the time, didn't he? Yeah, he had some good sayings, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can't build an empire with someone who still likes the attention of the villagers. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> Did you just make that one up? <laughs> no. That's a fucking, I mean, I'm that's not going to that you. one. You know, I'm I mean, going to use that one on you, Frank. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, when I was a kid, I remember my grandmother, you know, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. He who laughs loudest laughs last. Mm. Um, Sometimes the grass is too long for the snake to see the lawnmower. No, that's a modern one that you've made. It's off DMX, that. Is it actually? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, as we were talking about, Phil obviously can do a number of sessions with people one on one yeah. or whatever, but he's got a new service out now, which is, you know, brilliant, especially for people during the lockdown period, mm. called the Mind PT Flicks. I'm assuming, yes. Phil bit of a Netflix style situation going on. Yeah, so in. essentially uh, because of the demand that, that that I'm getting at the minute, which is great, I can't get round to seeing all the people who are sending inquiries to me. Yep. Um, and I wanted to create something also that people could use on the go whenever. So just as you've got Netflix, I've created this like this online membership part of my website whereby there's, there's a range of videos um, around self-help, there's hypnotherapy audios, there's meditations, there's techniques. 
and people can access it on the phones whenever they want. It's eight pounds a month. It's updated monthly with new content. It's really good for anyone, maybe because I know a lot of people are having financial hardships at the moment. Yeah. And maybe can't afford sessions or, mm. you know, also there might be people watching, like I'd always like to say to people is, if you are concerned about your mental health, always go to your doctor first. Always yeah. speak to the NHS as your first protocol. Maybe then you've had some therapy or some medication from them and you want to supplement it with something. Yeah. My MPT flicks might be the thing for you. So, but uh, Frank, I mean... I don't have to tell you how many messages we have from people who watch the podcasts, who listen to the podcasts, who watch the vlogs and stuff like this and the live videos. You can't Everyone's... believe it. We didn't think of people coming on saying you've really helped me out during the lockdown. I was terribly depressed. I mean, one fella came on, remember, and he said, didn't say he was going to take his own life, but he said something like, you know, I was in a very, very dark place and I couldn't see a way out. And uh, some fucking thing I said, he said... <laughs> <laughs> some stupid thing and he went that made me realise yeah. no but at the same time what I'm what I'm trying to get Life's across is living. a lot of people you know uh, are in sticky situations right now the lockdown's really affecting people I think but people I didn't when the lockdown first kicked in there was a panel a, a panel of people on television they were all talking about different aspects of what could happen and, and this woman came on she said we've really got to be careful with mental health problems and I said to myself well, no, you know, people have been out, been out of work. People have been out of work. People, but because it's lasted so long, people can't really see a way out of it. And there are people who are taking their own lives now. Yeah. People who are getting very depressed. Um, the government have been great in one way where they've tried they, they, they put a block on evictions. You can't be evicted from your home if you can't afford to pay the rent or the your mortgage, whatever. But at the same time. People's quality of life has just took a nosedive where, you know, socially people can't go out, they can't go to pubs, they can't go and watch an act, they can't... Uh, I mean, young people, there's no nightclubs. How do people meet each other? Yeah. You know? I mean, it's affected. The whole fabric of society just been totally shattered. It's gone to kind of like probably what it was like during the Middle Ages. Yeah. I mean, I see my nan today, the first time seeing my nan for what? Seriously, since the summer. Mm. Because she's been that worried, she had a few health conditions, and she was like say, well, saying terrible. she felt like a prisoner. Well, not only that, people have got no money, so you don't see as many cars out on the road because no one's got any money for petrol. There is a lockdown where you're supposed to stay in anyway, you know, other you can go out for food, but you've got to stay in your own house. So, I mean, I think it was about two weeks ago, I went out on a Friday night. I mean, this has been horrendous for me, I've been. 40 years I've been on the clubs every Friday, Saturday, Sunday working. You know, to take that away, all of a sudden you've got no work, so you're sitting in the house. I'm living on my own, so I'm sitting there. You know, the walls are coming in. You're feeling horrible. They went out one night just for a drive, just to get out for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just to feel as though, you know. And I'm driving around. I went to the garage up in Ainsley Long Lane. <laughs> I've just felt like uh, Will Smith. In I Am Legend? Yeah. <laughs> there were no cars. I thought you were going to say Fresh Prince of Bel-Air then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, he had his cap on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no cars. And I saw a couple of people, but they looked, they just looked like those, those like, what they, whatever they were in, 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 in uh, I Am Legend. Like, they looked so depressed and anxious and little masks on them and just walking around, yeah. hobbling around. People have just seemed to seem to have lost all the kind of like um, energy and the viv and go and, and the kind of um, happiness has been taken away from. People are just robotic now. It's horrible. Yeah, it's scary. And, and not only is it difficult now, it's what's it going to be like, like afterwards because mm, yeah. there's going to be massive skills shortages in every industry. Education's took a massive hit. Even sports. So I'm, uh, there's a lot of like young professional boxers who come to me and they just don't know when they're going to fight and a lot of them are going to have to spew it probably because they're no shows they're not making any money well, they, same they, with any entertainers no, who's financing them they're yeah. not making any money if you're not making any money you know there's no purses that at the end of the, there's no fights mm -hmm. and even though I, I, I know a couple of guys I've brought uh, people that you know and I know and Will knows um, one guy he was like uh, world champ I won't mention his name, just to embarrass him, but I met him and he looked really depressed and he's, he's trying to promote fights. So there's a knock-on effect. It's not just the boxer, it's the trainers. Yeah. It's like a nightclub closes. You've got the bar staff, even the lads who are on the door, the bouncers, the, uh, the, the cleaners that come in the next day. 
Yeah, it's yeah. massive. You know, it's just such a terrible the DJ, terrible knock-on effect for everybody. So in the end, um, it's probably been the worst thing to it. The world really for an awful long time. I'd say for for, for guys watching then, because I know you guys have shared with me some stories of like your your viewers and your listeners. First thing to remember, being a being a bloke as we are, as most of us are watching this, where I I was doing this. With, I've got three sons, and I was doing this until I realised. So my eldest is six, Oscar, um, and say Oscar's playing on Fortnite or whatever, and he loses, and ah, he starts crying. I'll say, stop crying. And I'd say stuff like, I used to say stuff, come on, oh, stop being a little girl, come on, stop crying. Yeah. Now, what am I teaching him? I'm teaching him to suppress his feelings. We were all taught from a young age, boys don't cry, you need to be big and strong. Yeah. Which means our emotional intelligence isn't that high, so it gets to the point where when we're feeling anxious, when we're feeling stressed, when we're feeling heartbroken, sad, whatever, yeah. one, we can't really put our finger on how we feel and why we feel. Two, we don't know how to talk about it and because we feel stupid. And three, we feel like we've got no one to talk to. When actually us three, you know, guys in here, um, we, we've we all had times of depression. Oh, we've all had times of being me. down. And you need to speak to someone. And you know what, guys? Even if there's people watching that might think this, I'm just saying all this to promote me or Mindflix PT. Mm. The best people you can speak to are free, the Samaritans. Free phone, the Samaritans. Yeah. 24 hours. Yeah, but I think that's the key of why I wanted to get Phil on here as the very first guest. Because I know... You know, we've got such a good connection with the people who watch and listen. And we treat them as family, really, Frank. And we're not really saying that in, you know, I'm no. not saying that as a fluffy no. thing. We've just got such a good relationship with people. Now, I wanted to bring Phil on as the first guest because I know people are struggling. And it's not a case of, as you've just said, airy fairy, go and talk to someone and it seems a million miles away from you. There's people like you, Phil, that are just, they're just one of the lads. And, you know, yeah. It, you know, if there is anyone, I mean, Frank, you've been struggling. As, you know, you'll be no old spy, honest about this. You've struggled probably more than most people during the lockdown period, haven't you? What kind of like emotionally? You mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. Only for a couple of reasons, really. You know, like a lot of people, I was. We were flying. I was doing fantastic. We were doing very well. You know, on every front, really. Fuck it. You know, we were on good fees. We we're all on good money and we we're employing people. You know, we had security guards that were working for us, you know, kind of like DJ support comedians. And uh, the whole thing was on a roll and getting kind of more famous, more well-known everywhere we were going. You know, I was people queuing up around the clubs on my picture and shaking hands with everybody, every corner of the country. Suddenly all that's taken away. Gone. <laughs> You're just in a house on your own. You can't even go out. Now, it's like I'm in the bedroom at night and I phoned my sister up last night and said, just lying on the bed watching the telly, and I said, i am really got something playing on my mind. Uh, I've got to make a big decision. And she said, what is it? I don't know whether to go downstairs or not. You know, mm. or it's a joke, but it's not far off yeah. the truth. Whereas if I go to the Asda now or go to the Iceland to get some milk and things, it's like going... Like going to Ibiza. <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. <laughs> because yeah. in your mind, it, and it really is, because it must be like having a, a mouse or a rat, you know, a rodent or something that you're experimenting on. And you're used to feeding them and whatever and giving them water and, and they're in this lovely warm place. And then if you put it in like a cage where it's not getting fed, you know, if you give it like a peanut one a day, it would look forward to getting that nut, wouldn't it? So yeah. I, I look for, I buzz in, I'm like a, like a heroin addict that's just been injected, go into the Asda. I can feel myself being, I'm, I'm going to go in the shop because everything else is being taken away. Every enjoyment, the clubs have gone, you know, even if it's just for now anyway, even if it's temporary, there's no work, there's no kind of like journey. And I used to love journey and used to get to train a lot of places, staying overnight, different parts of the country, meeting people in the crowd. And, and all that's gone. I mean, and that's not just for me, that's gone for everyone in the UK, everyone in the world, really. Do you know what, though? We, we should be, you know, grateful in some respect, though, that no matter how hard it is, we, we've still got some things that 90% of the world haven't got. We've got running water. Yeah. You know, most of us watching this have still got a bit of food in the cupboard, still got a bit of heating. Yeah. So what I'd say, the challenge that we're faced with is, OK, we can't get our entertainment, we can't get our interaction as we used to. What can we look within and do? 
What can yeah. we read? Can we be creative? Can we get in touch with old friends, phone them, text them? My advice to anyone watching is struggling is, is do these two things. Number one, set yourself one little goal every day. Even if that goal is, you know what, I'm going to get dressed today because we'll see you in trackies all the time, so you know what I mean, <laughs> yeah. footy shorts on. I'm yeah. going to get jeans, I'm going to dress today. One goal, I'm going to get dressed today. Second one is um, routine. Routine. The repetition is, repetition is the mother of success. Okay, yeah. He's back again ding. with his quotes. <laughs> Should do a little ding with He's each one. Again. <laughs> right, so if you can put, think about this from an early age, routine is drummed into us. So I know with my three kids, when I'm with my three kids, I know what time they have their school meal. It's 11.30. I make sure they eat at 11.30. I do things at the same time because they need routine. So one good routine anyone watching can have is, it's called savers. And that's from a book called The Miracle Morning. Adapt it as you wish. Savers, without going into too much detail, it's it's things you do each day. You could do them all on the same day. You could spread them over the week. The first one is silence. Sit in silence. No phone, no Facebook, just sit. The second one is some affirmations. Repeat some, because Muhammad Ali used to use affirmations. Affirmations program your mind. Today is going to be better than yesterday. Each and every day. I'm getting better in each and every day. So there's this amazing thing. Uh, it's from a book called The Miracle Morning and it's it's about putting this positive routine in. And you can you can do all these things at once each day or you can do a bit each day, you know, take it easy, do one each day. It's called Savers. You can Google it, it's all on Google, but I'll very quickly run through it. So S stands for silence. Have a little bit moment of silence with your cup of tea, no Facebook, no phone, just silence. A is for affirmations. Affirm some positive suggestions to your brain because your brain's a bit like Alexa. It takes everything in. It works on them. For example, each and every day I'm getting better in each and every way. Or even I feel happier today than yesterday. Um, that's S, that's A. V is visualise. Spend some time visualising how that day is going to go. E is for exercise. Get yourself moving each day, be it just stretching, be it going for a run, doing weights, whatever, like a walk. R stands for reading. Do a little bit of reading. It keeps your brain active or a crossword or whatever. Um, and S stands for, sorry, scribe. Write some things down. Now, you might not be one for reading. You might not be one for exercise. Get a couple of them in at least, guys. You will notice a positive difference with them. There's a group I'm part of, running group, the Marshall and Harriers. And I'm in a group with a few of the guys there. We're called the Ultras. Okay. Um, the big fans of you, Frankie, the Ultras. Oh, really? Very funny guys. Maybe the yeah. Marshall Arias. The Marshall Arias as well. Okay. Yeah. Funny, there's got to be a joke there. And I was just telling me, mine's spinning about, you know, the Marshall Arias. Yeah. You know, it's got to be because, you know, I, I always, for years and years, anywhere on Merseyside, really, I'll do it. I used to do gags about Marshall, you know, little kind well, of like. Every time you shut your window, you're tapping someone's fingers. And, <laughs> you know, uh, I was Marsh on Marsh Lane and the copper said, accompany me to the station. And I said, what for? He said, I'm fucking telling you to go on my own round here. <laughs> and it did years ago. It was a rough Marsh Lane. So the, the runners, Marsh Lane, had it. There's got to yeah. be a joke there. Well, no, listen, what it is, it's uh, one of the guys, Paulie and um, Jamie Carragher's brother, John, okay. love the fitness, love the running. Yeah. And and these guys are really serious about the run, doing a lot of marathons. And in the first lockdown, what they did was they started this group where they went for socially distance runs and they started to call themselves the Marseille area. So I joined the end of the first lockdown yeah. and it's just built momentum. There's hundreds of us, men, women, kids. They yeah. facilitated um, the... Um, the renovation of the running track, you know, Chaffers. Okay, yeah. They raise loads of money for charity. Loads of us are doing a London Marathon. So I'm doing a London Marathon for a charity called Smile Train. As part of that, I'm fighting Tony Moran, former professional boxer, to raise money. I broke my nose in sparring last week. He's chipped me bloody front tooth. <laughs> I'm to get my teeth done. So, um, but there's a group anyway. So they're raising loads of money from Marsh Lane Harriers. Find us on Instagram. But there's a group of, of, of us runners. We're the naughty ones. We've got our own WhatsApp because we post naughty stuff in the WhatsApp group because we're a bit silly. Okay. We'd love it. And they love you, Frankie, the Ultras. So if you give the Ultras oh, we'll a shout out, we'll, we'll give a shout yeah. out to the Ultras, eh? The Ultras. The Ultras, yeah. I'll meet those guys, yeah. Yeah. Bring them to the shows. Yeah, definitely. So just back to the savers you were talking about, yes. Phil, before we wrap that little segment up. Um, so even if they just. Even if the guys just take one of these, one of them each, one day. of these little things, and the importance of routine, yeah, I mean, it's massive for me. Fucking hell, as and an half help. Listen as well, anyone watching, get in touch with me. I'm not on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Will I'm sure you can share me details. Yeah. I'm on my email. You can contact me for a little chat, a little few words of advice. You can recommend a few things. I'm always happy to help because I've been there. A lot of you guys may be feeling depressed. 
money worries, women worries, health worries, whatever. There's not a problem that you guys are going under that someone else hasn't got through. Yeah. And, and you know what I mean? You've survived every day in your life so far. And in the grand scheme of things, when you look back on the washing line of your life, this period of time will be a small pair of socks. Yeah, I know. Like that's that what one. I was saying. That. Yeah, you look <laughs> look back on things and you'll just remember it as I'll remember the lockdown. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's yeah. all it'll be. Yeah. Now, love Davin Phil on today. It's been unbelievable. But there is one thing Frankie wants us to cover before we finish. Now, it's something that you're fascinated with. Well, I'm fascinated when I spoke to Phil about this before when uh, I had my sessions with Phil. The background to it, a few years ago, many years ago, really, there was a TV programme and it was called The Bloxham Tapes. And what it was about, there's a guy called Arnold Bloxham and he was a psychiatrist and uh, he used to use hypnotism. He used hypnotism to try to... Um, to, to speak to people about the fears and things while they were under hypnosis. But he, he hypnotised one girl and she became another person. But she became another person, another personality, someone that had lived hundreds of years before. Mm. And he had the idea to get four or five different subjects voluntarily hypnotise them and to see if he could take them back to previous lives. Now, one guy, the very famous case that he got... Under hypnosis, this fella, who was like just a guy in the 1980s or 90s, whatever it was, an ordinary fella, he took him back to where he was an, a naval rating. He was a sailor on Nelson's flagship, the Victory, during the, um, during, I think it was the Napoleonic War, or the Battle of Trafalgar, that's it, it was the Battle of Trafalgar. And um, been very fined by people at university, professors, linguistic professors, while he was under hypnosis, the words he used for the cannonball, for the cannon, different parts of the deck on the ship, which aren't in common use today, uh, were 100% right. He couldn't possibly have known the language he was speaking at the time. Under hypnosis was the same language that they used 200 years ago. So what's your own thoughts about that, Phil? Past life regression, taking yeah. people back. Do you believe in it first of all have you ever yeah. done it and would you be prepared to do it because i i'd be a subject you know? i i do believe in it i have done it f i've done it for past life i've done for about 200 people um i've had it done to myself now i'll talk about what what it could be first and i'll tell you some some interesting things that i've experienced with it if you want okay, okay. so th the, the three main the thing with me as you guys know no know, knowing me is i'm yin and yang I'm, I'm technically a scientist because I'm a master of science as okay. per my qualifications, but I'm a Reiki master. So okay. I'm a bit science, a bit spiritual. and part, So I'm always looking for what's the scientific explanation. Now, one of the beliefs in hypnosis is that when you get hypnotised, you go into an altered state. You either go into an altered state, you either disassociate from yourself, or you, you role play. Okay? okay? So the best way to imagine our brain is we, we, we're living in a room in our mind and we're in that room most of the time. But there's other rooms that you don't know about. There's a cellar that you don't know about. Okay, basement. Not like Fritzl's. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, when you get hypnotised for your past life, the doors open, a trap door, and you're going down into the cellar in your past life. So say I, do, I hypnotise you, past life, and you're a cowboy. Yeah. It could be you watched the cowboy film when you were little and you, you identified with it and forgot about it. Could be you had trauma and you'd mind seeing the context. Yeah, but, but it, it could, could be you be were a cowboy. That you'd lived before yeah. and you're regressing back to that spirit yeah. that's still with your the body. Soul. You know, Buddhism really, reincarnation. Yeah. I know you've, funny enough, it's strange really, because uh, somebody, a friend of ours, Jack Ryan, he uh, he got me this statue of Buddy yesterday. Yeah. And brought it into my heart. And I thought, that's strange. The last time I saw Buddha was in Phil Steele's. Yeah. It's in yeah. your office. Yeah, mate, yeah. I remember that. Well, so... And, but Buddhism is reincarnation, yeah, isn't it? even in Christianity. There's the belief in Christianity that... So the Bible, as we know it, there was a thing called the Council of Nicaea where they decided what books to put in the Bible because it's a collection of books. Yeah. And they took some Gospels out called the Gnostic Gospels. In them, they say Mary Magdalene was Jesus' wife. They never, they never made the cut, yeah. Well, one of them that didn't make the cut was that uh, the reincarnation exists in the in the Christian okay. faith. But anyway, so going back to the to past life, so there's the, the views of what it could be. Now, when I learned hypnosis, you practice on each other and we practice past life. 
this guy here, he was like a farmer. This woman was a nun. And I'm thinking, it could be real. When I got done, wow. I was a French count. I was dead arrogant. My face changed. I was very cocky and arrogant. I was a Nazi soldier, which horrified me. Oh, my God. Hey. And I was in a burning fire in Austria, in, in looking through this debris. And I hated my job and I hated the Nazis. But my final one I went to, I was on the Nile and I had crops with me. And, and I thought, that's so fantastic, it cannot be real. So I've done it to a lot of people. I've had one guy, a cage fighter, sit down in front of me, hypnotise him, take him to the past. And in the past, he was uh, on a beach fighting with a sword. And he suddenly oh. goes, ah! and I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, because you can talk in hypnosis. He's like, she's been stabbed. So I'm like, okay, in a minute, I'll count to three. We'll take you to a happy place. No, I want to see what happens. I was like, no, no, we'll take you to some... No, I want to see what happens. And this is what he did, swear to God. Okay. He went. Oh, my God. I thought he died. Yeah. So I'm like thinking, one, Fucking I'm thinking, hell. shit, I've killed someone. Yeah. Two, I'm thinking, he's a scary guy. And when he wakes up, he might knock me out. Then he went. And I went, okay, you're all right. Tell me where you are. And he said, I'm in this desert. And I was like, what's your name? And he was like, I don't know. And I was like, is it hell? And he said, Fucking no. Hell. Said, is it heaven? And he said, no. Sounds like purgatory. Oh my God. So the next thing he says, this guy's coming. He's got a big beard. He's giant. I went to ask him his name. He said, his name's Zeus. So I was like, is it the Zeus? He said, no, it's Zeus. And I went, he's got a message for it. He said, yeah, be good. The next thing, bam, he's in this other life and he's trying to find some, some um, cup or something. Now, the name he gave me was this Greek name. He didn't know the name. I didn't know the name. When I went back and Googled it, there was a myth which was quite rare, which I didn't know about. The guy, he was thick as two short plants. Yeah. No disrespect to him. He would not have known this. There was a myth about the guy whose name he told me and Zeus oh, sent no. him on his journey to find this cup. <laughs> so I've had that. I've had, I've, had, I've had a woman who, she's always thought she had a son, but she's only got one daughter. Always thought yeah. she had a son. It's always bugged her. Yeah. Um, we took her back in the past. Wow, so sad. She was in Australia in the 60s and her son got took off her by social really? services, yeah. Um, As another person, though, yeah. she was, yeah. I've had people who, spies in the war. I had one person, and I'm not going to name names at all, was married to someone in a notable Liverpool crime family, very oh, notable God. crime family. Okay. And she won't mind me talking about it, I'm not reading anything at all. In her past life, she was married to the pharaoh. No one liked the pharaoh. She was having an affair with a nobleman or whatever in ancient Egypt. Mm. And they killed the pharaoh. Fucking and the people were overjoyed and made up. Her face, her whole body changed. I remember looking at her jaw. Because when I'm inside someone, I'm looking around. And I looked at her. And I was like, bone structure like ancient Egypt. It's crazy. Well, Phil, what's your own take on what's the actual mechanics of what's happening? Do you think it's a spirit entering them? Do you think it's their spirit from a previous life? Or do you think it's, as you say, another part of the brain yeah. which has fabricated the whole thing and it's all kind of a dance, it's fictional? No, I'll I tell you what it's like. Imagine you found a video from when you were in primary school yeah, and you watch it and you're going, oh, that's that's Mr. Johnson, remember? It? Oh, yeah. and there's Kevin. And, and yeah. the, you know, with the, that's yeah. how it feels when it comes back to you. Yeah. So I think most likely with these people is they are tapping into these repressed memories in the mind, definitely. Cause, so you think they've lived before, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of like reincarnate, reincarnation. Yes, because yeah. the way you feel after it and the way these all felt after they got so much out of it, the, the, the poor woman with the son who got took off her, she, she felt so happy and relieved. Well, um, it's strange, isn't it? I've never had a feeling, now this is something I've never discussed with, would never tell Will or never really told anybody. Since I was a kid, I've never had a feeling that I've ever lived before. Mm. But... Um, I've got a feeling that I'll, I'll live again in like yeah. another hundred years, and I'll I'll live abroad. I'll be in like I've always thought of being. I think it's Spain, a very hot country, but I'll come to Liverpool and 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 I'll know that I've been here before. And yeah. it's, it's strange as though I'll be walking around Liverpool. I'll come here for some reason, yeah, and I'll think I've been here before. You know, one thing that did interest me. So I was teaching hypnosis to a, a group of people and I was t I, I was like does anyone want me to show your past life and he went yeah so I, I hypnotised one put them under done the past life now this woman was born in about 1972 uh -huh. in real you know as we know her now and her past life took her past 1972 so she was alive in the past and lived beyond 1972 
And I, for a while, that really stumped me. But listen, we don't understand the fabric of time. Time is like a river. Yeah. How do we know it doesn't loop? Consciousness, okay. infinite consciousness. And there's a guy, there's a hypnotist I know in Scotland, and he, the Scottish vote for independence, he hypnotised himself to go and see what the outcome of the vote was and the number of votes and that, and he really? was pretty much and spot it was right, on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's, it so it's something you could work on. And, and, and Do you feel as though you've got another life to live, Phil? You, have you been done it to yourself? Have you regressed to yourself? Or I've not taught myself forward, but I, I believe. I mean, there's an ancient Egyptian belief, which is when you die, there's an Egyptian god um, uh, called Anubis, and he oh, weighs sorry, your soul. Anubis, yeah. Doesn't want to chase you over the water. Yeah, and if your yeah. soul's heavier than a feather, you've got to live again. And I mean, in, if you if you're spiritual, it's it, you believe that until. You know, every life you're given the same, the lesson repeats until it's learned. Yeah. Whether or not we live again, I don't know. I think my my main goal in life, Frankie, is to make my son's lives as as easy as possible for them. Yeah, sure. And you know, on that note, because I think this resonates with me and you and Will, the way you're going. If you have children one day, mate, which I think you will, is remember this. Jazza Dickens told me this. He said, to be a workaholic, to be a workaholic father can sometimes be a form of abuse. Because here's me working in my office every night till nine, ten, thinking I'm doing it for my kids, I'm making money for my kids. They just want me home playing time with them. With them yeah. Yeah. yeah, they want me home playing with them. So any guys watching this under that pressure, sort your work life balance. There's a happy medium between making money and spending time with yeah. the kids, isn't that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Brilliant. Defo. So anyone who's um, wondering about the past life regression, yeah. Can you do it over Zoom and stuff while the lockdowns? Yeah, listen, there? you know what I can do. What I do a lot of as well. I do a lot of Zoom classes online where. It's very uh, affordable where everyone might tune in. You can turn the camera off if they want and I'll either do a hypnosis on anxiety. I could do past life regression. In fact, I've got a past life regression one coming up. Okay. <laughs> this isn't planned. No, it's uh, not going. No, I've got one coming up where you pay, you tune in on Zoom, you get a video of it as well. I'll hypnotise you. I'll put you into your past life. You may or may not encounter something, but I'll take you to a place where you can oh, possibly yeah. do it. But I can always do, a, we could do anything, mate. We could do it live on, on a podcast, yeah. whatever. Brilliant. All sounds good. So well, maybe the next podcast, I'm up for it, Phil. If you can, you can yeah. regress me. Defo. I know I could. Yeah. Let's go for it. <laughs> Excellent. Let's do the next one. Get him on again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. As soon as possible. Massive thank you for having um, the Mind PT, Phil Steele, on today. It's been great to have you, Phil. And um, if anyone wants to go find you, Phil. Yeah. So, in. Instagram, please, guys. Uh, it's at the mind underscore PT. At the mind underscore PT. Um, you can go on my website, www.themindpt.com uh, or, 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 yeah, or you know, contact through Facebook and Will and, and Frankie can pop mass, pass messages on to me. And Brilliant. I would totally, as I do on most of the videos when we speak about Phil, I always re recommend him as being the guy who got me to fly after 20 years of being terrified of even walking into an airport. So that's the, uh, that's the strength of him. So any problems you've got, if you're a flying dentist, doctors, whatever, get on to Phil Steele. And if yeah. you've been traumatised by Frankie at any of his gigs. <laughs> 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 no, but as we said, that you know, the, the one of the main reasons for doing this today was because I know a lot of people have been feeling down, and, and rightly so with, this, with the hand that we've been dealt at the moment. Reach out, you know, you know, if it's not even to a friend or, as you said, to the Samaritans or your doctor or anything like that, you know, we're always here. Drop us a message. Phil's here, he can really help you out. Phil's at the end of the phone, an email, whatever, he'll speak to you, help you out. And uh, as I always say at the end of all of these, communicate with people. If you live alone, it's the solitude that's going to depress you. Yeah. So try and speak, even if it's just a postman, speak to anybody at all during your day. Go to the shop, strike up a conversation with people, keep it going. So a uh, great thanks to Phil, who's been fantastic today. He's thanks, been brilliant. Thanks. So all of Phil's details will be in the show notes or in the video description. You know, it's been a pleasure to have him today and it's been a pleasure to have you all watching or listening. So massive thank you from myself, Will Cranny, from Frankie Allen, from the Mind PT, Phil Steele. All the best and we'll see you on the next one. All the very best. Thanks. Cheers.